never long-winded, unless we're talking sports. Uh -huh. uh, but I trust that our time tonight will not be sports-filled, but rather spiritual. Spiritual, our message from the Word of God tonight. Third John, first one, the Bible says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish that above all things, that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey, after a godly sort thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake, they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who love to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Demetrius hath good report of all men, and of the truth itself, yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our, our record is true. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity given us to look into your word tonight. Lord, I just pray you would help me to make your word clear and to only speak what you would have to say to each and every one of us tonight, that we would be perhaps encouraged or challenged by the by, by your word. Um, and Lord, I would just I just pray you would meet with us in this in this time we have to look into your word and uh, just help us all to glean the precious truths from it. We thank you and praise you praise you for it and uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to uh, look at a few points tonight regarding which person we should be in our local church. Now, third, now just to give you a, a little uh, a historical aspect on the book of 3 John. Uh, 3 John was written somewhere between the period of 85 and 95 AD. John is the last surviving apostle. All the other apostles have long since passed away and gone on, gone on into eternity. So, but John, but John is left. John is the one who leaned on Jesus' breast. He's still around, and he's here in the. He's going to be writing here to uh, a man by the name of Gaius. He's going to be, and he's writing to Gaius. Presumably, he's not at this point yet been exiled to Patmos, because the Isle of Patmos was where he wrote the Book of Revelation. But he, presumably, if he's not exiled to there yet, he will be writing this book from Ephesus. And so he's known Gaius for a number of years and considers him well-beloved. In fact, he led Gaius to the Lord and called him one of his children. He complimented Gaius and others he knew personally in verse 4 in saying that I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. In fact, Gaius' testimony was well-known. Verse three, verse 3 denotes just how his testimony was positively affecting others and word got back onto that. Back to this. So let's look at verse three again. He says, "For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth." He was get, he was given a good. They were giving him a good report, which got back to John, and John was commend, and John was here commending Gaius for his testimony. This was a thrill to John, and I'd like us all to examine our testimony whether our testimonies are having a positive, direct impact on the work of God. In fact, I liken it to the car showroom. Everyone wants to look at us and know what is good about us. Um, not as much. <laughs> Just like cars, though, people are quick to point out faults and flaws of that specific vehicle. And Christian, same is true in each and every one of our lives, myself most certainly included. 
It's up to us, through God, to have the good direct impact that allows us to have an unshakable, uncompromisable testimony. And that not only is seen of those here in our local church, but also to the lost and dying world around us. However, we're out not being good testimony, it's going to hurt. Souls may, be, may be, souls may end up spending an eternity in the wrong place because of someone's sin in a moment of weakness. The question each one of us should ask ourselves is, Lord, could my testimony convict a soul of their need to be saved? Or is my testimony harmful to the work you are, you are trying to do? I know we all fall short, and we definitely need to brush up our display models so that when the time, when the drive test, uh, when the when the uh, driving test comes, we prove our worth through the work of God in each and every one of our lives, and we don't end up crashing the the, the, mo the model. But if we cra if we crash the model, God is more than God. God will work with us. God continues to work with us even when we do crash. He doesn't He doesn't give up. We can get we give up on our old cars. Some of us give up on our old cars. <laughs> but, when we, but when we give up on our old cars, it doesn't mean we stop driving. We just get something better. God doesn't throw the clay away. He remolds it. He makes it, he makes it again. He makes it whole again. And he wants to do that with each and every one of our lives. I didn't go on a rabbit trail. I'd like to look tonight at two contrasting testimonies presented here in our text, particularly in verses 9 through 12. These two men couldn't be any more different. In fact, they are indeed polar opposites. Diotrephes was headstrong, while Demetrius was humble. Diotrephes was hot-headed, while Demetrius was hospitable. Let's start with uh, Diotrephes. I'm going to read verses 9 through 12 again. The word of the Bible says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. I'll stop right there. I'd like to bring the case against Diotrephes as saying that Diotrephes attempted to destroy the work of God by his testimony, or lack thereof. He was working with Demetrius in this church, which either was pastor of Gaius or was in Gaius's house, or Gaius had some part to do in this church. It's not specifically stated what kind of role Gaius had, but we must assume that he was definitely close to the situation on hand. He was working with Demetrius in this church, which, I'm sorry, Diotrephes. Um, this church was not far from Ephesus. Now, Diotrephes, if you look at it in the Greek, it means nourished by Zeus. Zeus, as we, as many of us happen to know from Greek mythology, whether you studied, whether you, you went to a public school and studied it, or in, even in passing, you've probably heard of the name of Zeus. Zeus is a pagan name. Why he decided to keep it, I do not know. Many who got saved changed their name to a more Christian name. This would, of course, include the Apostle Paul, who was once named Saul, and then God changed to Paul. This was opposite of what the Babylonians did. In Daniel chapter 1, the pagans who overtook Judah, which of course was led by the evil king Nebuchadnezzar, who would later turn, who would later repent and turn his life, changed the, him, and, him and his hunchmen changed the names of Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and Daniel to Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Belteshazzar. Just because a person's name is or isn't changed doesn't mean the person is changed. In this case, Diotrephes didn't change. 
and neither did his testimony. John wrote that he, referring to Diotrephes, receiveth us not. The point of being in church is to help up, is not only to hear from God in his word, to sing praises about God, but also to greet and recognize each of our fellow brethren. To receive them as like they were our own family, because they are indeed our own family. We may not all have the same last name. For instance, none of you want the, none of you want the, the last name LaCroix. Not only is it hard to pronounce, you have to spell it to every single person you run into. Why can't we all have simple names like Smith? A simple name like Smith, or Price, for that matter. <laughs> simple last names. Now, some of us may have last names that are a lot more confusing than LaCroix. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to name things. But, the point of the matter is that we all are part of the same church family. This, this local body that God has planted here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And we want to receive, we ought to receive each other as fellow helpers to the truth. Receive, receive, I want to receive Brother Lee like I want to receive Brother Taj and our sisters. I want to receive everybody the same way. Diotrephes did not. He receiveth us not, wrote John. He denied Bible doctrine of any sort. Yet somehow, he deceived those in this church and got himself elevated to a high position in this assembly. What position he got to, we're not told. But whatever it was, he had quite the impact. But it was not the impact he ought to have had. In any time a headstrong person gets power, that is usually nothing but trouble. He loved to have the preeminence. He loved this high position where if he saw anybody to be a threat to the goal he wanted to accomplish, his, he made it his goal that he was going to drive them out at any cost. He was not going to receive that fellow person who he thought was going to challenge him and say, this is wrong teaching, or why do you not favor so-and-so. Diotrephes was destroying the work. I'd like to note three things about Diotrephes. In that first, he wanted definitive authority of the ministry. Definitive authority of the ministry. He was supposed to be under whoever was in control, whether that had been Gaius or John or somebody else. John had previously sent a letter to Gaius, as he wrote here in verse 9, I wrote unto the church. At some point, John must have written a letter. But Diotrephes, you, you know sometimes when you're send, trying to send somebody a private message and it gets intercepted by the wrong hands? Uh, probably, let me see if I can find a great example. All right. <laughs> um... Remember, some of you might remember in public school, we uh, wanted to pass notes to uh, pass a note along to probably some girl or some guy we were trying to get a hold of, and it usually gets and sometimes it gets intercepted, and they read the message and like, what is this? Usually it gets intercepted by the teacher, and then you get in trouble. Diotrephes must have intercepted this letter. And after perusing it, he utterly destroyed it. Oh, let me see what I got here. The atrophies is probably like, oh, let me see what I got here. Bad things about me, bad things about me. <laughs> Circular file. He disagreed with John's evaluation of him, and therefore he disregarded it. He didn't want anything bad being said about him. He didn't want other people to get the thought of, hey, this guy, is that he's, he's, he's up to no good. He's not, he's not saying correct, he's not, he's not using correct doctrine. 
He doesn't like a lot of people. He's been driving people out. We need to get this guy out of here. But instead of doing that, so, I mean, when John seeks to do this first, Diotrephes ends up intercepting it and gets rid of it. He wanted to quell any threat. He wanted definitive authority of this ministry. Second thing I'd like to note about Diotrephes is that not only, first of all, he wanted definitive authority of the ministry, but now he drove others away from the work of God. You drove others away from the work of God. Note verse 10. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. John said he would remember his deeds, which he doeth. Some of the people, perhaps some of the people in the church might have thought that they might not have been paying enough attention to know what exactly was going on between Diotrephes and everybody else. They might not have taken note of what was going on, but it wasn't getting past John and Gaius, that's for sure. John, know, John knew what was going up to. I, John said, I will remember his deeds which he doeth prating against us with malicious words. <clears throat> Diatrophes spoke slander of John and Gaius and probably others in the church. He was not content with the other brethren. He would not receive others, whether they were members there or stop or just stopping in. If he saw anybody as a threat, he was going he was gonna do whatever it took to make sure they were not a threat to what he wanted to do, which ultimately was the, to attempt and destroy the work of God. Those that ignored his directions were kicked out, and he also forbid others in that church to be hospitable and friendly. Now, if someone were to tell you to not be hospitable or friendly to so-and-so, you would think something would be up too. At least I would hope so. Well, Diotrephes told everyone, maybe, maybe perhaps he had a close circle, but this, this is only conjecture at best, by the way. Maybe he had one or two other people that he might have been, he, that he trusted were not going to assert the authority he was trying to get in this church, in this ministry and said, if you see anybody being hospitable, inviting people over for dinner, get them out of here. I don't want anybody to be nice to anybody. That's not, that's not what we're commanded to be. We're commanded to be hospitable and friendly. More on this in just a minute. So first, he wanted definitive authority of the ministry. Second, he drove others away from the work of God. But third, I'd like to see that he deliberately ruined the testimony of this ministry. His conversion, if he was saved but quite backslidden, certainly was up for question. And he made a bad name for himself. It takes but one big thing for a person to ruin themselves forever even long after they're gone. Only takes one thing. Consider, consider some of the names, consider OJ, consider Joe Paterno, consider other names who may have had pretty decent lives until one thing came up. And when that one thing came up, their lives were changed forever, other lives were changed and ruined forever as a result of one person's actions. It only takes one sin. We don't know where one sin is going to take us. Sin will take you further than you ever wanted, to, than you ever thought you were going to go, Christian. And no better example than of myself. I've had those times where I thought, oh, it's only one little sin. Next thing you know, I don't want to come to church. 
You get you, Satan starts working in your mind to get you to think, oh, I don't have to, uh, it's only one service. You don't have to go. Nobody's going to miss you. Nobody wants to take you out to lunch anyway. You eat too much. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to say hi to you and talk to you about the latest ball game or how your walk with God is going. Satan will get you to believe anything, Christian. It only takes one sin. And whether Diotrephes only had one sin and this snowballed out of control, or possibly he may have been playing church for a long time and getting himself into the position where he could wreak havoc. But whatever the case was, now it only takes one sin to ruin that, that, ruin that life. And be sure that sin will find you out. These works, the works of Diotrephes, prating against people with malicious words, not being content, not receiving the brethren, forbidding those who receive brethren, casting souls out of the church, which wasn't even his, those are not the works of good men. Those are works done by men who are not submitted to God and the Holy Spirit. This is not the work of a true, born-again, God-appointed pastor. This is the prideful, boasting, hard-headed deeds of a proud pastor wannabe. He disagreed with solid doctrine. He engaged in discouraging chatter. And he furthermore displaced and displeased the other brethren. You probably could have cut the tension in this church with a thick knife and you wouldn't have gotten anywhere. The Bible says God resisteth the proud but giveth grace to the humble. He certainly does. Pride is the work of Satan and it quickly entered into a heart of a man who used it to wreak havoc on a church run by a good man. We're not to follow evil. Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Rather, we're to follow good and to follow good men who are submitted to the word of God in their lives and people who demonstrate the work of God in their lives. This is the tale that is told of a man by the name of Demetrius, verse 12. It said, the Bible says, Demetrius hath good report of all men, and of the truth itself, yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. Demetrius is another one of John's children who walked in truth. Now, the, now if you did a, a character study on the Bible character, Bible name of Demetrius, you will find his name only mentioned twice. Here in our text, and also in Acts 19. Whether that happened to be, Demetrius happened to be a pretty common name, so we can't, you, you, there's no point in arguing that this, one, this guy was the same Demetrius or not. Because the Demetrius mentioned in Acts 19 is a silversmith who are ma who's making idols for Diana. Whether it be, whether it been the same Demetrius who got, ended up getting saved and became this good report or not is up for another, is, is, is another discussion for another time. We're going to go off the assumption that he is not. This would be a different Demetrius used in this different occasion to be a good report and to be a testimony of one who demonstrated the work of God as opposing to destroying the work of God. Good testimony, good reports, is not just a testimony. It's a lifestyle. And it's commanded in the scripture. This is one of the traits Paul told his young, his young uh, man in the faith, Timothy, that he must have in order to be and remain qualified to be a pastor, 1 Timothy 3, 7. This is to not show hypocrisy in having different standards in or out of the local church. Demetrius was spoken well of by those who were unsaved. Could that, have be, could that be said of us? that we would have a good report even among those who are lost and not in our church? It's okay to have good report of everybody. In fact, we should have good report of everybody here. After all, who knows it's better than the people here? Well, maybe other than our own families. 
But, say you're walking down Dixie Highway. Could it be said of the person that was walking down Dixie Highway that you ran into, that you had good report? Challenging all of us, myself most certainly included. Could a lost person tell if we are truly different? The same is said of deacons in the local church. The seven deacons of the church of Jerusalem were said to have been of honest report in Acts chapter 6. Let's all pray and ask God to give us resolve to have our testimonies be of good report so that we can be solved in this dark and increasingly deceptive world. Demetrius was quite the opposite of Diotrephes. He knew who had the authority of this local church, and this was neither of them. He was a man who could be trusted. Perhaps even Demetrius was handpicked by John to personally deliver this letter to Gaius so that it would not be intercepted by diatrophies, perhaps like the last one was. It doesn't say, but it, it, it could be that Demetrius had such a testimony that John trusted him. Remember what the psalmist said. I'm sorry, I'm um, going back a little bit. This man was probably handpicked by Gaius to go to Ephesus to be with John and receive the letter that would be canonized and preserved forever in Holy Scripture. Remember what the psalmist said when he said, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119.89. Oh, he encouraged those in the local church to be hospitable, demonstrating it himself if he need be. Hospitality is a must if you are a born-again Christian. Paul had a little something to say about being hospitable when he says, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Hebrews 13, 1 and 2. Moses spoke to this as well when he says, And if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19.33-34 Christ shared a lot on strangers and the treatment of them in Matthew 25.35-40. We're not going to turn there. Those who are hospitable even to brethren and non-brethren alike will have done it unto me, as Christ said in verse 40 of that passage in Matthew. You never know who's going to ask to stay at your place one night. Could you or I possibly have hosted the missionary or evangelist or family that leads many souls to Christ? And perhaps just that one little night, we have taken them out for a meal or put gas in their vehicle or gotten them a train ticket out of town or a plane or a flight to their, or, or a flight to their destination. Could that be the little spark that's, that brings many souls to Jesus Christ? Could we be the one to, to turn the life around of a person who is away from God and, and receives the glorious gospel and is saved and then goes and shares the gospel themselves and many souls come to Christ? All that could be done by just one simple act of hospitality. Could we host that next great, great missionary or pastor? Let's seek to be the friendliest local church. Let's seek to be the most hospitable local church. Let's seek, because we never know this side, we'll never know this side of heaven, just what that one little act can do. Demetrius not only talked it, but he walked it. Practice what we preach. Myself and into others. Remember when the words of Paul, when he said, Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 1 Corinthians 9.27 We have compared the testimony left behind by two men. <laughs> Diatrophes, whether he was saved or not, he certainly wasn't a good testimony. He certainly left a bad taste in the mouth of Christianity. Prating against people with malicious words. Not being content. Not receiving the brethren. Casting people out of the church. 
proud pastor wannabe. That's all he. That's what he was. He was not a man who was submitted. He wanted people to submit to him. And if he saw anything coming, he was going to get rid of them. Too many pulpits, unfortunately, in this nation are filled with proud pastor wannabes. But, praise God, there are many like John, Gaius, perhaps the pastor of this church, if he is not one of those two men, and others. They're humble, they're hospitable, they're honest, are those people, and thank God for them, including the dear shepherd that the Lord has blessed us with, Pastor Price. Thank God for the example we have here in Demetrius, who demonstrated the work of God by accepting his God-given role in the church, showing hospi hospitality, and making a good reputation of himself and his local church. Let's remember those who have the rule over us. Let's follow those who are over us, as long as, of course, they're preaching, teaching, and living the word of God. While they're our pastor, let's remember that. Let's remember who we are, who, who, just what position we have in our church, in this church, and what position our pastor has, and and, and submit to them and obey. They're going to give our account of our lives while we're under their ministry. Paul alluded to this in Hebrews thirteen seventeen. Our rewards in heaven are at stake. Let's not make our pastor grieve when he gives account of our lives. But rather, instead of seeking to rather instead of seeking to destroy, let's seek to demonstrate. We may not need to go to the point of a diatrophies to be attempting to destroy the work of God. We can do it by just being a bad testimony. And there's almost no bigger hypocrite than I when it comes to this kind of a thing. But rather, let's seek to be demonstrators. Let's seek to demonstrate the work of God. Let's go out and tell souls that need to be saved. Let's win them, with, let's win them by love. Let's win them by using the gospel, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's demonstrate his love in our lives. Let's demonstrate that he cares to the lost and dying city around us. Let's pray to God that we can be demonstrators of his great work. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the, for the word which you've given us. Thank you for the example of Demetrius and John and Gaius, who were used of you, who were men of good report, and that John had no greater joy than to hear that his children walked in truth. And Lord, I pray now that thy children would walk in truth. Let it start with me. Let it start with anybody else. Let it start with everybody else here tonight. Let it start with your children. Let it be said of us that we've had good report. Let it be said of us that we're demonstrating your work in our lives. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to, even when, even when we do fall, Lord, help us to get right back on the boat. So that we don't that we don't seek to destroy your work, but rather to demonstrate it. Lord, I do pray for our pastor as he is away. I pray that you're giving him that you give him and his wife safety as they travel, that they would enjoy their rest, and that they would return recharged, ready to be the shepherd, ready to be the pastor he wants he seeks to be as he follows you. Thank you for the time we've had to look into your word. I pray you keep us safe this week. Help us to be here Tuesday for visitation and Wednesday night again to hear from your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.